Hey humans, it's Hannah. Welcome to the second channel. This should be the first video on the second channel. I decided to make a separate channel just for the scary listener stories because I decided that as much as I love making them, I don't want to confuse people that might stumble onto my main channel where I make the majority of my income and then see those videos, be very confused about what the channel's actually about and then unsubscribe or not watch my other videos, stuff like that. Or sometimes it just messes with the algorithm and if some random videos of yours don't get views, sometimes you YouTube is just like, mm, people must not like your channel anymore. And they yeet you into, you know, the YouTube outer verse and you're never to be seen again. That's a little dramatic, but you know what I mean. So here we are. Here's the new channel. We're going to do listener scary stories. This is obviously mostly just for fun because it's fun. And yeah, I have an editor for these videos now. Her name is Taylor. Taylor, if you want to say hi, please feel free to do that here if you want. No pressure. So if for some reason you did just randomly stumble onto this channel without knowing my main channel, Hand of the Horrible, I have no idea how you would have done that. But hey, hi, welcome. Here, this is more of like a podcasty type thing. There's not as many visuals and all that. You just listen to stories. You can zone out and have this on in the background and just have like calming, creepy stories on in the background if you want. I know some people like to listen to it like that or feel free to, of course, watch however you'd like. But I think these videos go best with with a nice cup of something warm, coffee, tea, hot cocoa, whatever. Get a blanket, snuggle up. Let's get right into it. Directions for how to submit your own scary story are always down in the description below and on the channel about me and all that. So, oh, Right. One other thing before we get into it. Um, this is, since we're kicking off the channel, as well as it's October, which is spooky season, we are doing special Halloween themed episodes for the next couple of uh, videos. I did ask people to submit Halloween themed stories. They didn't have to be like super Halloween themed, but just like happened around Halloween or something involving Halloween or just something extra creepy and stuff like that. So not all of the stories are specifically Halloween themed, but I did try to mix in as many as I could just for fun. Okay, now we're going to start. This is story one. This one goes, hi, Hannah. This one is not paranormal and it's the sort of story that isn't scary until you've had the opportunity to look back at it and consider the implications. Oh boy. It was like every other Halloween when you're a kid. You get through the school day, you come home excited, do homework, have dinner, get into your costume and wait until it's dark enough to start going door to door. Oh, core memory unlocked. Wasn't that so fun? Or when Halloween, very rarely when Halloween happened on a Friday or a Saturday and you got to go trick or treating, but then you got to stay up late too. Oh, those are the days. Back then, it was considered completely safe. We kids got together in a small packs with our friends and roamed the neighborhood, often without our parents, until we were too tired and too weighed down with candy to go on. Most of us would stay out until everyone turned their porch lights off and houses went dark and quiet. Wow, that's late. That was probably like 11 o'clock. Dang. About halfway through the night, a helicopter started circling, not directly over our neighborhood, but close enough that it could be heard and clearly seen around and around and around. This was unusual. Back then, no one had smartphones or even really cell phones yet. We couldn't look anything up or text anyone asking questions about what might be going on. Instead, we would ask people who answered their doors as we were trick-or-treating if they knew what the helicopter was about. And as many people were watching the evening news, the story coming together with each new person who had information to offer. Apparently, a prisoner had escaped. Some people claimed this escaped prisoner was dangerous, a murderer, but lots of us thought this must be part of the festivities and that people were just trying to scare us. Nevertheless, the streets started gradually thinning out. My friend's dad found us and insisted we go home. I stayed out longer with my other friends, and by the time I got home, my mom was visibly shaken and very relieved to see me. I bet she was. It turns out a prisoner really did escape, and he really was a murderer. The next day was reported that he had been successfully captured and that he had had a ghost face mask on in his possession. 
which is the part that made this a little chilling to look back on once I got a little older. Because that was the Halloween after Scream, the original one, as I further date myself. Don't worry, same. Had come out and these masks were popular. I remember that. Everybody had those masks. They were scary. They were everywhere as they still are today. And there had been countless people roaming around wearing them that night. This guy could have been anywhere. We might have scurried right on past him as he attempted to blend in with the Halloween crowds. None the wiser. You just never know, do you? Thanks for reading. That story was from Casey. Wow, Casey, that's a great story. I love that it wasn't paranormal. Actually, I thought that was really fun. Um, What the hell? To think back to be like, I could have just passed the person that was escaped from jail and they picked Halloween so that they could be in a costume, which, by the way, like not encouraging anybody to commit crimes in the first place. But if you're going to escape from prison, I'm sorry, that's smart. You can't deny that. What the hell? Oh, my God, that's so creepy. Story two starts, hi, Hannah, I go by Noah, she, they pronouns and absolutely love your channel. I'm so excited to see where this series goes. Thank you, Noah. This is definitely going to be a longer one. I'm not sure if you'd want to read it in a video, but I wanted to tell it anyway. I've been wanting to get this one off my chest for the longest time. Feel free to cut it down if you want. Never. I would never do that. I grew up in a family that wasn't shy about believing in ghosts. My mother and maternal grandmother often told me about how the woman in my family especially had some kind of psychic powers. Like my grandmother saw a little girl giggling at her from her closet one night a couple years before my mom even got pregnant with my older brother. Once my mom had me and I started growing up, my grandma realized I looked exactly like the girl she saw in her closet that night. Eek. Those kinds of powers. Needless to say, I was used to strange experiences from a young age. Things like ghosts didn't bother me. To me, they were just something that existed alongside us. I described myself as a skeptical believer. I think ghosts and such exist, but I do think that a lot of evidence and experiences can be explained through logical means. Love that. During my freshman year, I decided to stay over at my friend's house Halloween night with her and her younger sister since they only lived a few blocks away. For the purpose of the story, let's call them Jenny and Kathy, not their real names. We were stupid teenagers at this point. Jenny and I were 14 at the time, and Kathy was a couple years younger, about 11 to 12. We got up early on November 1st, around 9 in the morning, and we decided that we wanted to test and see if me having the aforementioned supposed psychic power powers would draw ghosts to me even if we weren't in a haunted building. So we made a makeshift Ouija board and sat in their front yard trying to see if we could contact something. Like I said, dumb teenagers live and let learn. That is so funny that you mentioned that because I was just having this conversation with my mom the other day. I went to the Curiosities and Oddities Expo over the weekend and found a 90s secondhand Ouija board and let me tell you, I'm sure I'll share it on Instagram once I get around to it, but I was so excited. It was the first thing I bought. I bought it within five minutes of entering the expo. And I was talking to my mom about it. And she was like, didn't we all do that as children? Like make random Ouija boards, play light as a feather, stiff as a board, call Bloody Mary in the mirror during sleepovers and stuff like that. And I think that's just like a coming of age. Like everybody, groups of kids, when they have slumber parties, they do creepy things, you know, not knowing that if ghosts are real and something crazy happened, you would be screwed, but it's fine. Jenny was kind of nervous about the whole thing. I'm not sure if she believed or not, but she certainly was afraid we would make contact with something. And Kathy was 100% a skeptic. She didn't believe in ghosts at all. So we started using the Ouija board and we were getting next to no answers, just silence. Kathy kept bragging about how she knew nothing was there and ghosts didn't exist. So I asked that anything that might be there prove to her that it was. Kathy begins jolting and looking around, telling us that something was poking her side. Jenny and I were both sitting on the opposite side of the board of her, and we each had our hands on our makeshift planchette, so there was no way either of us could have touched her. Emboldened, I asked whatever was there to prove beyond a doubt that it was there. Kathy fell over onto the sidewalk. 
<laughs> I'm so sorry. That's not funny. Laughing and twisting her body. Jenny and I asked her what was happening. And between laughs, she told us something was tickling her. And that's when we started getting responses. Whatever it was we were talking to claimed to be a girl around Kathy's age and said that was why it only interacted with Kathy. She also said she hated Jenny and I because we were too close to her older brother's age. She claimed to be named Brianna Nicole and lived in a house nearby with her grandmother and older brother and died in a fire. While we were going about our business, I looked up for a little while to talk to Kathy about something when Jenny very timidly asked, is it supposed to be doing this? I look back down at our board to find the planchette moving backwards through the alphabet. I immediately shoved it to goodbye to close out the session. We destroyed the board and went our separate ways. I thought that was the end of it until a couple months later when Jenny and Kathy suddenly showed up at my front door with one of Kathy's friends from school. They asked her if they told her anything that happened on November 1st and she assured me that they hadn't. She then proceeded to tell me that she was sitting near an old abandoned little house that you could see from my front yard when a girl dressed in white came up to her and introduced herself as Nicole. She said they talked a little while before Nicole told her that she had to leave because her grandmother was waiting for her. The friend watched as she headed towards the abandoned house and walked through the wall. Since this house was visible from my yard, I turned my attention to it, watching it with interest. There were some ragged curtains in the window facing my yard, and while while I was staring, thinking about how cool it all was, the curtains moved. Of course, at first I thought it was the wind, but it was the exact center of the curtains that moved, like somebody was peeking out. And despite all my previous experiences being relatively chill and not scaring me even a bit, I was suddenly flooded with terror to the point where my instinctual reaction was to scream bloody murder and run away. I had never been more afraid in my entire life. That was the actual end of it, at least for those three. But then strange things started happening around my house. I'd constantly feel something staring in my bedroom window. I'd randomly get this pressure on my chest and feel like I was choking or suddenly unable to move for five to 10 minutes at a time while there was pressure on me, but never while I was asleep, which rules out sleep paralysis. I'd suddenly be overwhelmed with fear and terror while sitting alone in my bedroom. I started feeling like there was something in my mother's closet that was watching me when I was in her room. My dog started waking up in the middle of the night to stare at the corner of my my mom's bedroom near her closet and how what nothing which she had never done before then one day my fan was suddenly pushed from on top of the dresser I kept it on even though it was on a stable surface another day I started smelling smoke and found my lamp which had been unplugged knocked over on the floor and turned on burning a hole through my carpet. I can remember two separate occasions where I was in the living room waiting for my mom and older brother to get to work when there was suddenly a loud bang against the inside of my brother's bedroom door, so loud that my dog also reacted to it. My brother had been sleeping in the living room for months and I hadn't been in his room since he'd started sleeping in there. It all came to a head one night when I couldn't sleep. I've had insomnia pretty much my entire life, diagnosed by the time I was 15. So while all of this was ongoing since it kept happening until I was about 15, 16 or 17, but long going before that. And so I was used to not being able to go to sleep until three or four in the morning. It was normal. So I knew I wasn't asleep. I promise I was wide awake. On top of this, I've never experienced night terrors or sleep paralysis. It was around 3 a.m., it always is, and I needed to go to the bathroom. So I sat up, swung my legs over the side of the bed, and froze. I'm not quite sure how to explain what I saw, but I'll try my best. Sitting in the center of my bedroom was a giant mass of shadows. It was dark and substantial enough that I couldn't see through it. It was vaguely the shape of a giant dog, if some form, and there were two red dots that seemed to be the suggestion of eyes. I live in Texas, and our house didn't have central cooling, so I tended to sleep in shorts most of the time, so my lower legs were completely bare, which is important because I could feel cold air against my shins coming and going and coming and going like breaths. And then I saw cold air 
I mean it. It was freezing. I want to pretend it was my fan, but my fan was small and was diagonally across my room on the top in an alcove on top of a dresser that was taller than I was standing up. And I only felt the air against my shins. I was paralyzed for a few seconds, just able to stare at it before I slowly pulled my legs back up into bed, laid back down and turned away from it. Good call. Good call. By the time I got the courage to turn back around, it was gone. Needless to say, I didn't get much sleep that night. I started sleeping in my mom's room not long after that. That little abandoned house always gave me the heebie-jeebies when I saw it, which was often, but it was torn down for unknown reasons a while later. We moved out of that house a couple years after that, and I'm happy to say that I haven't experienced anything since moving, which was a good few years ago. I'm still not sure what that thing I saw in my room was, and I doubt that whatever we contacted was actually the spirit of an 11 year old girl Hmm. but I know what I experienced and I know I never want to experience anything like that ever again thank you so much for taking the time to read this even if you don't use it for your channel looking forward to future videos thank you Noah wow that's a really long detailed story my only thought was like maybe because Kathy didn't believe you guys and maybe because she was like see ghosts don't exist my brain can't help but go to like maybe she was messing with you and maybe she started reacting to things just to mess with you guys and then started like messing with the board as well I want to say that's probably unlikely considering she was only 11 or 12 and that would be quite an elaborate backstory to make up on the spot and then spell it out in a Ouija board so that would be quite unlikely, I guess, but that could explain Kathy. As for the thing in your room, I have no idea. If you're open to logical explanations, the only thing I can think of is, I mean, or the only thing I'd like to suggest is that perhaps because you were also a kid and you were also not sleeping, and I would assume you're going to school too, so you were probably very sleep deprived if you had insomnia, you know? And I'm just wondering, is it possible? Like, yeah, you were definitely awake, but is it possible that your brain was like playing tricks on you because you were so sleep deprived? Like sleep deprivation can do really, really bananas things to us. And again, I don't know. You would definitely know better than I do because I did not live it. But that was like, if you're looking for logical explanations, I wonder if that could be it. I have a friend that has insomnia and she would have sleep paralysis episodes a long time ago. And I know that you said it's not sleep paralysis, but it was just interesting because she told me that like, yeah, sleep paralysis does sometimes you wake up and it feels like there's a monster literally pressing on your chest and trying to kill you and like sometimes you can even see this monster and then you wake up and it really is a phenomenon of sleep paralysis like it is something that your brain does because of sleep paralysis like she never thought it was a ghost she knew it was her sleep paralysis so I don't know it's just really interesting to me that it's like what our brains are capable of is a lot more than I think we think they are on the other hand, I'm also leaning more towards like if if there's something out there, if ghosts are real or whatever, is it possible that a lot of us just aren't susceptible to it? Like you said, psychic powers, stuff like that runs in your family and your grandmother and stuff like that. And they definitely don't in mine. And sometimes I just wonder like, maybe it is all real and the majority of us just don't see it ever or experience it. And so we just think it's not and that it's all BS, but really it's because we're just not susceptible. We don't make ourselves susceptible to that kind of stuff. You know, just like I've talked about like me and Mickey, like Mickey has had experiences. And even when we went to Las Vegas together, she had a terrible experience at the Haunted Museum that we went to. Uh, we we talked about it in the podcast, if you guys want to hear the full story of that. Thanks, we hate it. Shameless plug. And, uh, but I had absolutely no issues. She had a headache the second she walked in. She felt like something followed her home, all that. And she has had experiences like that. And I literally felt nothing, had no issues whatsoever. So it just kind of got me thinking, like, maybe it's not that it's not real. Maybe some people just never are never going to experience it. Moving on here. This is the third story for today. Hello, Hannah. My name is Josh and I my name is Josh, not Joss, and I recently found your YouTube channel. To start, this is a Halloween story. Yay. Thank you, Josh. 
My family periodically runs what we call the haunted forest on the property my family owns. It's one of those haunted attractions people walk through to get scared. That's so cool. I try to go to a haunted attraction every year if somebody just had one in their property. Oh my gosh. Josh, tell the truth. It's none of my business. But was your family rich growing up? Because that would cost thousands of dollars to put on, right? Anyway, pretty much all the proceeds go to something charitable. Okay, that's so sweet. I love that. So we do it for fun mostly. Unfortunately, the last couple years we couldn't have it because of the pandemic. Several members of my family, including me, are high risk. Me too. This happened several years ago. My dad is the guild for the groups so people don't wander off the marked trail. It is family friendly, but still scary according to the visitors. We would have several community teens be characters in it. My dad made sure that each night he knew who was acting and made sure at the end that no one was missing. There was plenty of trusted adults with handheld radios to watch over things as well. Very smart. So the night in question started normal. A large crowd had gathered before opening and we were waiting in line. About an hour into the night, a lady told my dad the kid with the chest tattoo and black eyes was creepy, but he should have a shirt on because of the temperature. (laughs) I love ladies. I would imagine she was on the older side. That's so funny. Okay. It was pretty cool that night. He sent a call over the handheld radio that we should check all the actors to make sure no one had a shirt off. I'm sorry. I don't know why that's so funny to me. I'm getting the giggles. After checking with all the kids and adults because the tattoo was out of place for a kid, nothing was found. But more importantly, no one there had a chest tattoo. Later, another person told my dad that the little man with the tattoo scared the crap out of him. Again, the search was made, this time more extensively with my dad searching and speaking to everyone himself. None of the actors admitted to seeing anyone with the chest tattoo. This happened two more times. The last person remembered the exact location. It was opposite the coffin where my cousin plays a vampire. My cousin swears there was no one there. He never saw or heard anything. He is also one of the adults with a radio. At that, we swept the grounds with no luck. After closing, another search was made with no luck. The thing is, no one who was working saw this person. I always looked for a rational explanation to any creepy or paranormal occurrence. This has the obvious one of it being someone who came in another way without being seen by anyone. That's the only part that gets me. None of us saw or heard anything. The ground was covered in leaves where this person was supposed to have been and they would have been heard. To this day, we have no idea who or what these people were seeing. They gave detailed descriptions that didn't match any actor there, but all matched each other. A short male, either a child or some described him as a little person, shirtless with a chest tattoo and completely black eyes. They could not see the white of his eyes. I always looked for alternative answers to spooky things. This very well could have been a stranger who just wanted to scare people and just walked in from the opposite direction. Our property is part of a large forest and sits at the foot of a mountain. I live in the Appalachia. This issue I have with it being a stranger is the person never interacted with anyone but the people he scared. I'm still at a loss on this one. One of us should have seen or heard him. I love your channel and would love to know your opinion. Thanks, Josh. You want to know my opinion? I don't know. I don't know, Josh. That's really, really fucking creepy. I would 1000% be like, that is somebody who knows that you do this every year. They live in the area. They decided to put black contacts in and just be without a shirt. They walked through the woods and snuck in to the little trail and just started scaring people just for the hell of it. And then they wanted to make sure that you guys didn't see him, I guess, because they he knew that he would get kicked off the property and he was having fun scaring people. But I just, again, like you said, I don't know how nobody could have found him. Like nobody saw him. None of the other actors or anyone around him saw him except for the people walking through the maze. 
that's weird. Again, because if there was a paranormal explanation, I don't know why the ghost would not want your family to see him. Why would he only want the other people to see him and get scared of him? So that doesn't make any sense. That's bizarre. Thank you for the story. I like that one. That one's super unique. Oh my gosh. What the heck? Ah, Okay. You guys are getting me so excited for Halloween. All right, our fourth story starts. Hello, Hannah. My name is Kelly, she, her, and I am from Albuquerque, New Mexico. I love your channel slash videos. You are fun to listen to. Thank you, Kelly. You guys are so sweet. I have two stories for you. One might work for Halloween. One was told to me by my dad, RIP, and the other happened to me personally. I really do hope they intrigue you. I'm so sorry about your daddy. I hope he rests in peace. That is not fun. Okay, this first one was told to me by my dad. Daddy was a long haul trucker from as young as 20 years of age. He grew up in a time when kids went to school or worked, the Great Depression. So he quit school at ninth grade and started working, eventually becoming a trucker. The things he saw, he usually didn't talk about, but this one thing stood out for him and actually scared the living hell out of him. It was, if I remember correctly, the 1950s. He had not moved to New Mexico yet. One night, he ended up having to pull the semi-truck over because there was a police roadblock ahead of him. So dad got out of his truck and noticed a convertible with its front smashed in. As he walked down the road a bit more to go talk to another driver, he saw in the car two people. The male who had been driving was obviously dead and he was slumped over in the driver's seat and bloodied. The female passenger was sitting upright with a very stunned look on her face. Her eyes glanced at dad and she blinked. Remember that. Daddy gets another Sorry, you keep writing daddy and I feel weird saying daddy to somebody else's dad. That's weird. I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to say dad. Dad gets to the other truck driver standing nearby and asks what happened. The other guy tells him that the police think the driver of the convertible fell asleep at the wheel and ran head on into the back of the semi. Both people in the car were killed on impact. But dad said that couldn't be right because the lady looked at him and blinked. The other guy said that that couldn't be because the windshield went through her neck. So dad goes back and looked. Sure enough, the windshield had decapitated her. But she was still... (laughs) But she was still blinking and moving her eyes. That was the first and only time dad ever told that story. What? what he what i don't like that that scares me a lot decapitations in general but the fact that she was blinking i don't i have no i have no reaction to that that must have been absolutely horrifyingly traumatic for your dad nobody would get that image out of their head ever ever Okay, story number two. This one is a nice one. (laughs) Yay. This is my own personal story and it happened when I was around 12 years old. My grandpa was a big part of my life for the first few years of my life. He taught me to ride my bicycle and through that he taught me that no matter how many times you fall in the sticker bushes, you get up and keep trying. He was a quiet kind of strength and talented. I got my artistic skills and curiosity from him, I am sure. He used to make these wind spinners out of old soda cans and they were so pretty. But grandpa ended up with prostate cancer and this once beautiful vibrant man wasted away as the cancer ravaged his body. I was around 12 years old when this body finally gave in to the illness. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. Man, you've experienced a lot of loss. Dang. Now, when you're 12, the concept of death is strange. You understand what it means to die, but not necessarily grasping what it means that you aren't coming back. Yes. So I understood grandpa was gone, but at the same time, I thought it was a dream of sorts. But a couple months later, and it's summer, it's hot, and it's the middle of the night one night. I was thirsty, so I got up from bed and went into the kitchen to get a drink. In order for you to understand this part, you need to picture our back door to the patio. It's a sliding glass door with a sliding screen door, too. On this particular night, we had the screen door shut and locked with the glass door open to let the air into the house. I'm standing in 
in front of his door drinking my water when I feel something behind me. I turn around just as a wonderful soft breeze drifts into the house. And there was Grandpa. He looked as I remembered him, happy and smiling with that wonderful scent of Old Spice. I don't really know if he actually spoke to me or not, but I got the impression he had. It's okay. I'm fine and still love you. That's what I heard. When I woke up, I was in bed. And to this day, I don't know if I'd been dreaming or if it actually happened. So there you are. I hope you like my two tales and can use them. Much love, Kelly. Kelly, your writing style is so good. I love you like really paint a picture, but tell it very concisely. Like good job because I really, yeah, I really like the way your stories were written. I mean, I'm inclined to think that's a dream, but like who's to say that our loved ones don't visit us in dreams after they've passed on, right? Like we don't know. There's a lot we don't understand about dreams. At least my understanding is that like there's a lot we don't understand about them or what they're about and everything. And like maybe what if that is a way for them to visit us? So like even if you were dreaming, it still could have been him checking on you and giving you a message. Just saying. Our fifth story for today starts, hi, Hannah, from another Hannah. Love that. You're never the only Hannah in the room, I always say. It's a very common name. Firstly, I love your channel. I can't wait for all of your Halloween content. So I don't really believe in anything supernatural, but during my first year at university, I lived in halls. There were 10 of us living together and all our rooms off one long corridor that ended with the shared kitchen and living space. I'm guessing you are from somewhere in Europe, possibly the UK or somewhere in Europe, because for all my US friends, it sounds very much like a dorm. Like that's what we refer to as a dorm. But yeah, I've never heard an American refer to it as the halls. I love that. Okay. Our first Halloween around five of us decided to spend the night drinking and watching a whole bunch of scary films. After a couple hours, someone suggested we do a Ouija board. Most of us didn't really believe in the supernatural and thought it would be a bit fun. We didn't have a proper one, so we made one from some paper and got a glass to use as a planchette. We decided to do it in my room as no one else wanted to do it in theirs, just in case. We all sat on the floor in my tiny bedroom, candles lit for ambiance and invited any spirits to commune with us. Then a whole load of nothing happened. The cup didn't move and eventually we all got bored of it and decided to go back to the living room. I was later told you are apparently supposed to close Ouija board sessions, which of course didn't do. Tisk tisk. A couple of days went by, and one morning I came into the kitchen. The guy in the room directly opposite me in the corridor asked if I was okay. I said, yeah. And when I asked why, they said they heard someone crying in the corridor last night from near the area of my room. A couple of the other people said they heard it too. Obviously, there was a lot of us in the flat and we asked everyone, but no one admitted to being the person crying. We just assumed the person didn't want to talk about it, which was fine. However, a couple days later, one of the girls heard someone crying, then raised voices. When she looked out into the hall, she saw a figure at the opposite end of the corridor from the kitchen through the door, which had tinted glass. The door was right beside another girl's room who was having problems with her boyfriend at the time. I asked her about it to check in. She was doing okay, but she said it hadn't been her. As the weeks went on, my bedroom lights started to randomly flicker and we occasionally heard more crying at night. It became a flat joke and we even nicknamed it the Phantom Crier. I did also once hallucinate someone was lying in my bed, but I was pretty high at the time. So I think it had more to do with that than any ghost, <laughs> you know college things. Another thing our phantom crier seemed to be fond of was standing outside doors. All of us also kept seeing a shadow as if someone was standing at your bedroom door about to knock. Our bedroom doors had a gap at the bottom where you could see the light from the hall. But of course, when you open the door, no one was ever there. I also learned I apparently occasionally talk in my sleep. One night, a whole bunch of us fell asleep in the living room. And at one point in the middle of the night, I sat bolt upright and pointed into the corner of the room and said, it's over there before lying back down fast asleep. Not that any of the others got much sleep after. That's so funny. <laughs> there isn't a big finish. We all just moved at the end of the term and have never experienced anything since. But me and my wife have always joked that we got our first year halls haunted and wonder if the next lot of students ever experience anything too. So yeah, personally, I don't believe in ghosts. It was probably just a combination of coincidence and or people mucking 
about, but it was all pretty weird. Okay, now I'm positive that you must be from the UK because you also said people mucking about, which, oh my God, love. That is from Anonymous. Okay. (laughs) I would also be curious to know if you asked the students in the year afterwards, maybe you summoned something or someone and that poor little girl is stuck there now and maybe that's why she's crying and you just haunted that hall for all the students that come after you. I don't know. That is quite a coincidence, though, that it happened right after you were messing around with the Ouija board. Oof. All right. Story six. Howdy, Hannah. I hope you're doing well. I would prefer to remain anonymous just for privacy reasons for myself and everyone with the story, of course. For context, my boyfriend's family attends a pretty big Halloween party every year, which is attended by several family friends, family members, friends of kids, etc., I wanted to stress that the same group of people attended every year with virtually no family members or family friends being left out because it is important to the story. This particular story happened at a party either a year or two ago. I can't really remember which it is. I didn't personally witness what happened, so I have limited knowledge of what occurred. I can only tell you what my boyfriend's parents and sister told us. It's pretty rare for guests to start leaving the party until around one or two in the morning, so the party was still going strong when this occurred around 11 p.m. A group of people came in through the front door of the house, holding hands, all wearing pretty creepy masks. The timing was odd considering the party started around six or seven, and it's very unlikely that someone would be showing up fashionably late after four to five hours. They walked around the home, all holding hands, not saying a word to other party guests. That sounds very The Strangers, the movie. Everyone was obviously creeped out and had no idea who the people were, especially since practically every family member and family friend of the group of families in attendance were invited. After their walk around the home, they all left out the front door, not once letting go of each other's hands. All the guests dismissed it, assuming it was just some kids playing a Halloween prank and went back to enjoying the party. That's what my thought was, was again, yeah, somebody just like going, finding random parties parties dressed in masks and then crashing the party just doing something creepy and walking out however about 30 minutes after the party crashers showed up my boyfriend's mom received several texts from unknown numbers on her phone okay never mind they were very cryptic and reasonably creeped her out i can't remember what exactly each message said but i think at least one said something along the lines of we enjoyed seeing you at the party But don't quote me on that. I have a terrible memory. After that fiasco, nothing else weird happened and the rest of the party went pretty normally. We still to this day have no idea who those people were, but we can only assume it was someone who wasn't invited that wanted to play Halloween prank on my boyfriend's mom. Not the scariest of stories since it can be ruled out as a prank, but it was pretty creepy in the moment. I figured this would be a more lightheaded story to include if things get too dark and creepy in the video. Thank you. Especially since my boyfriend, his family, and I can now look back on the memory and laugh about it. I love your channel and I look forward to watching all of the upcoming Halloween content you have for us. Did you guys text them back? I'd be really curious to know. Like, I know I know you didn't know exactly what they said, but they must have said something like that. Like, oh, that was a fun party. Like, they must have referenced the party. That's so weird. It's weird that everybody was there. That was the other thing I was thinking. Was it like somebody who couldn't make it and then they could in the end? So they showed up? Like, was somebody at the party? Did they like, did a couple people from the party sneak out, put masks on, come in, do the prank? leave and then they like showed up and nobody noticed that they were gone you know what I mean like was it something like that but you'd think they would have admitted to that later yeah no that would really scare me if some random people crashed my party like that's one thing but if they're wearing masks and I can't identify them or know what they're up to I'd be kicking them out and if they didn't leave I'd be calling the cops because what the heck they must have known somebody though because they texted somebody from there they texted you so they must know who you are at least somebody okay I don't know it's fine all right let's read one more story I cannot guarantee that every single video is going to have seven stories usually I just do six so no promises that they're all going to be this long but let's do seven today so okay 
Last story for today. Hi, Hannah. I'm a new subscriber and really enjoying getting into your content so far. Thank you for all the work you put into your videos. I have a story I would like to share with you. And even if you don't end up reading it on your channel, I hope you get some entertainment out of it anyway. I have shared this story in October 2021 for a Halloween video by the channel Truly Criminal. And since I would like to keep everyone involved anonymous, I will use the same aliases that I used in that video. If you need to refer to me, you can call me Jay. Sounds good. I like where this is going because I've gotten a story that somebody said was they submitted it to another channel that read it as well. And it was a really good story. So this event took place in the summer of 2020. For a little bit of background information, my partner C and I were living with a roommate DJ in a three story walk up apartment. All the stairwells and apartment doors were outside and the building was fairly old and rickety. Very quickly after moving in, we became familiar with the sounds of neighbors coming and going to the point where we could generally identify who was coming and going based on their footsteps on the stairs and in the walkways. C's footsteps in particular were quite distinct to me since A, he's my partner, so obviously I would become familiar with his movements regardless, and B, he's an HVAC technician, so he wears heavy work boots and has a prominent key ring, so he sort of stomps around in jingles when he's wearing his work clothes. In that apartment, if it was quiet outside, you could hear him walk all the way up the stairs from the ground floor. Summer is quite busy for most HVAC professionals, and we were in the middle of a mild heat wave at the time. C was in the middle of a week-long on-call shift and so was in and out of the apartment for work at all hours of the day. The night this event occurred, he called out shortly after we'd had dinner and he warned me that he may not be back until around six or so in the morning. DJ was not at home at the time and hadn't been for a day or two. I went by my regular evening activities and went to bed around 11 p.m. I'm a pretty light sleeper, so I woke up around 2 a.m. when I heard heavy footsteps and the familiar jingling of keys on the stairs outside. I could track C from the ground floor stairs all the way to our door. I heard our front door unlock, open, close, and lock. I heard our hall closet open, shuffling and bumping of shoes being removed, and the closet door close. And then I didn't hear anything. I remember being happy that C was able to finish his job earlier than expected, even though I was surprised. And then I remember waiting for him to come into the bedroom, but he didn't. I dozed back off. I woke again, checking the time on my phone around 3 a.m. When I heard the bedroom door open, I figured C must have showered before coming to bed. I could hear him walking in the room. I felt the mattress dip. I felt the blanket move. I generally sleep on my side facing away from him, and even though I didn't roll over to look at him at that moment, I mumbled something to him in greeting. He mumbled something back, and I fell back asleep. It all felt very normal. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary to me. I woke up again around 8 a.m. when C got out of bed to go back to work. We texted sporadically throughout the day, but we didn't see each other or speak in depth until he came home for dinner. At this time, he was giving my friend Wilson driving lessons. She would come to our place, we would eat dinner together, and then all three of us would pile into C's car. He would teach her to drive and I would hang out in the back seat. So all three of us are eating and C is telling us about some of the jobs he'd gone over the past few days and brings up how tired he was when he came home this morning. I said something along the lines of, oh, but you got home way earlier than you thought you were going to. And I remember that C just gave me a funny look. He said, no, I came home at 630. I ate McDonald's in my van and watched the sunrise before I came inside. No, you didn't. You came home at like two. It was pitch black out. I had a weird, uncomfortable feeling in my stomach, but C thought I must have been dreaming, and Wilson suggested that maybe DJ came home drunk and climbed into the wrong bed by accident. DJ hadn't been home all day, and I have a hard time believing that he could have gotten into my bed without me realizing it was him, left without me noticing, and before C came home, and then entirely vacated the apartment for the day without me noticing he'd even been home in the first place but I digress. C sent him a text to ask if he came home at all, and the three of us finished eating and we started getting ready to leave. I was still sitting in the kitchen when Wilson got up to use the bathroom. The bathroom light was off, the hallway light was off, and even though it was a pretty small apartment, I couldn't see the bathroom from where I was in the kitchen. But I could see where Wilson froze in the hall, staring into the darkness. She paused there for probably a good 30 seconds or so, and I was just about to ask her if she was okay when she called out softly, C, come here. 
C moved to where she was and he stopped right behind her. Do you see that? She asked him. Yeah, he answered quietly. And before I could do or say anything, C surged past Wilson into the bathroom and slammed the light on. Light spilled into the hall and I heard him rip the shower curtain back and he said, everybody get to the car. Wilson was visibly freaked out. I was freaked out. C sounded freaked out. We left. Once we were in the car and driving around, they told me what they saw. A tall, dark figure standing on the edge of the tub, its head nearly brushing the ceiling. It was darker than the darkness of the room, and there were no windows in the bathroom or hallway for shadows or anything to be casted through. And when C turned on the light, nothing was there. While we were in the car, DJ texted C back. He hadn't been home at all during the night and was planning on staying at his girlfriend's place for a little bit longer. After that, we dropped Wilson back off at her place and C and I went home, even though we were both pretty nervous. A little while after that, while I was home alone, I got locked in the bathroom. Our bathroom had one of those knobs that you had to press down and twist if you wanted to lock the door, and that mechanism had been broken along as long as we had lived there. On top of that, the door didn't fully close unless you blocked it with a footstool or something. Otherwise, it would just swing ajar. It shouldn't have been possible for me to get stuck in there unless someone was on the other side of the door pulling it closed, but since I was home alone, that obviously isn't what happened. We moved out by the end of the year. We never truly know what happened. Maybe nothing paranormal was going on and maybe C was right that I just had a weird dream. I'd never had a dream like that before and I haven't had one since. I also honestly don't believe that I was asleep, but it's pretty odd that I didn't wake up when C legitimately came home around 6.30, so who knows? I also think the timing of C and Wilson seeing whatever they saw in the bathroom right after I had that experience is really weird and scary, but I personally never saw anything. I don't think they were messing with me because not only would they not find that funny, but they wouldn't have had the time to plan something like that. Anyway, I learned my lesson, lol. Whenever C comes home from working late, if I'm in bed, I always make sure to watch him when he comes into the room. I still get chills at the thought that something or someone other than him got into bed with me, whether it was a ghost or an actual person or whatever else. Okay, I don't know if you noticed, but that gave me chills too. I highly doubt it was a person because if it was a person who was invading your home, why would they literally just lay in bed next to you for a while? Get up and leave. That makes absolutely no sense. If somebody's going to break into your home, they want something from you. You know what I mean? They want to steal something. They want to rob you or, you know, worse. And not to mention, wouldn't C have noticed them when he came home then? I don't know. That just doesn't make any sense to me. Barring all other reasonable explanations, if ghosts are real, this sounds very much like one of those uh, rumors about like uh, doppelgangers or uh, mimics. Like sometimes have you heard of spirits that mimic the living and sometimes mess with you that way? And it sounds kind of like whatever this, I would assume it was that shadow thing you saw in the bathroom and it was mimicking C and doing it just to be a weirdo ghost. I don't know. That is bizarre. I don't have any other explanation for you other than the fact that that is so creepy and I... I don't know if I'd ever be able to sleep alone again, like go to sleep by myself ever again, because what the heck? So, okay, that's going to be it for all the stories today. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for tuning in to the brand new channel. I hope you enjoy these. Please like the video. It's free. It's easy. Leave me a comment if you want, and I will see you guys in the next scary story video on this channel. I will come up with a new intro and outro for this since it's a different channel, but I just haven't yet. So for now, it's gonna be awkward. Okay, I'll see everybody later. Okay, bye.